From the IMTV Wave Channel 5 studio at Greenville Senior High School, home of the Greenville Green Wave, the Greenville Veterans Memorial Park and Digital Library proudly presents Never Stop Serving. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Never Stop Serving. I'm Mike Maloney. I'm your host today, uh, Sam, Samuel uh, Plot. I'm filling in for him because uh, uh, it's a Wednesday. It's a special day. We have a special guest and a special day. Uh, yesterday was uh, Vietnam Veterans Day. So today, uh, as we're filming, is the 30th of March. It's the day after. Uh, this series is sponsored by the Greenville High School and Interactive Media and the Veterans Memorial Park and Digital Library. Today, our special guest is William Webster Jr. He's a Vietnam veteran and a Bronze Star uh, for Valor recipient. He's also the adjutant of uh, VFW Post 5018 and Free Pipe. Please welcome and uh, welcome home, William Webster. Welcome home, William. I'm glad to be home, sir. <laughs> William, please uh, tell us about your origin story, where you grew up, uh, where you went to school, uh, and then how you got in the military. Well. I grew up in uh, Dayton, Ohio. Uh, I used to live in uh, what was called the Humvee Ports at the time. It was a project off of Lake Avenue. And I went to Wagaman uh, Elementary School from the first to the seventh grade. In the eighth grade, I went to Jackson Elementary. In the ninth, I went to Roosevelt High School. And in the 10th, 11th, and 12th, I went to Roth High School, which I graduated. Uh, that's about, well, my parents are deceased right now, but uh, I was brought up in a very strict way. You know, my, my dad taught me things like, you know, uh, sticks and stones that hurt your bones, words that never hurt you, you know, those are things that you will always remember, you know, and that's why I've been able to be the way I am right now. And at my age, I'll be 79 this year. 79? So, yeah. Yes. Right. Uh, uh, please tell me uh, about uh, your branch of service you served in when you went in the military, uh, how that came about. Were you drafted? or? Well, what happened was I tried to be slick. I really did. I, I <laughs> tried to join the National Guard, you know, to get away from the draft and all of that. But when you join the National Guard, you have to sign up for like six years. Mm -hmm. And so I did four years and I got out. And when they started the Vietnam War, I still had two years left on my reserve. Mm -hmm. So that's what I got drafted for. Good. My first Good. year, wind up in Vietnam. It was very funny because like when I was in the National Guard, uh, I trained with what they call the M1 rifle. You know, mm -hmm. the right. rifle. Yeah. Right. But when I got drafted, I had three days training with the M16 prior to going to combat. So you can imagine what that is. And really, the National Guard is not really training for combat because you only have one meeting a month and you go to a summer camp two weeks out of a year. Okay. What, uh, so so you, you went into the National Guard, give me the years, of, uh, a month and year of service that you went into the National Guard. I went in in 1960 and I got out in 1964 because I still had two years left. Right. So you went to Vietnam in 65? Well, no. They, when they started the Vietnam War real bad, it was like in 67 mm -hmm. when I got drafted. So I got drafted, and I'm going to tell you a story. You're not going to believe this, though. I was working for General Motors Inland Manufacturing in Dayton. Mm -hmm. And I was working like second shift. So when they came into work, my supervisor told me, said, well, you know, since you don't come into the second shift, they want to see you at the draft board in the morning. I said, okay. So I go down to the draft board the next morning, you know, and I'll go in and talk to the lady. And she's like, okay, i tell you what, just go down to Cincinnati and take a physical and come on back home. Well, I went down to Cincinnati at eight o'clock every morning. I stayed down to Cincinnati at eight o'clock that night. And then we were all brought in a room like we are right now and you know, I'm thinking like, this is the room to where we can really go back to date, you know. Mm -hmm. Behold, this captain come in there. He said, I need all you men to stand up and raise your right hand. He said, you men now been sworn to the United States Army. You going to Fort Jackson, South Carolina tonight. I said, sir, I can't do that. 
I said, I told my mama, I said, come, I'm coming home. He said, son, you won't see your mama for 30 days. <laughs> so by me being prior service, I had already, it was like a private first class. Well, they put me in charge of 108 trainees. They just got drafted to go to Fort Jackson. prior service. Yeah, because I was prior service. Can you imagine that? <laughs> yeah. So I told these guys at the Air Force, if y'all miss that plane, you guys are AWOL. I can't, I'll have nothing to do with you. Uh, so, and, and then uh, you went to Vietnam, what unit? Well, when I first got to Vietnam, I was at the 90th replacement, which is in Saigon. Mm -hmm. And there they have everybody there. They keep you there until they assign you to your units. You know, I was there for like three days. And uh, when they start assigning uh, to units and stuff, it was like, I wind up with the 196 Light Infantry Brigade, which they're out of Fort Devens, Massachusetts. They're like the patches, like has a little flaming rope on it. That's the 196 Light Infantry Brigade. And anyway, uh, they had just moved up from a little area called Tainan City, mm -hmm. which the 25th Division took over. So when I got there, they were just moving up to Chulai, which is across from the Marine Air Base there. Mm -hmm. And that's where we were stationed at, you know, for that first year. That's where it was. Okay. Uh, do you have any other uh, memories or moments uh, you'd like to uh, share during your military experience, your oh, service? Oh, yes. What do you want? Oh, please let us know. Well, I, I tell you, specifically, I'd like to know uh, uh, what were the circumstances uh, around your uh, bronze? Well, my bronze star was my second year in Vietnam. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, I got drafted. See, okay, I went from like NG, National Guard, to U.S. when you get drafted, okay? Mm -hmm. And then I re-enlisted while I was in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. That's where they had sent me to. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you re-enlist, you go to RA, which is regular army. So one of the things was that when I re-enlisted, the recruiter, he gave me a choice. He said, look. You can go back to Vietnam, you can go to Korea, or you can go to Germany. Well, I know me and Germany ain't gonna get along, but it's too cold out there in the field out there. And in Germany, when they go to the field, they take everybody. I mean, like, you guys right now, what y'all doing? Y'all be in the field in Germany, okay? They take the cooks, clerks, and everybody. I didn't want to do that. So then, like, they said, well, you want to go to Korea? Well, I thought about it, but I'm like, no, nah, I don't think I want to be on that demilitarized zone getting shot at every day, you know. I chose to go back to Vietnam because number one, rank was easy to make. It took me 10 months to make E5 in Vietnam, okay? Uh, E5, is that sergeant? Yeah, sergeant. Mm -hmm. So, as soon as I got off the plane in Vietnam, they wanted me to promote me again. But I said, no, mm -hmm. I'll stay aside, you know, because see what promotion come more responsibility. OK, so anyway, uh, I chose to go back to Vietnam, went back my second tour. I was with the 11th Brigade Headquarters Company. Well, I was uh, opcon to a friendly Arvin, which is a friendly Vietnamese army unit. I was uh, opcon to their, uh, they had like a fire support base, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we had a lot of liaison people up there. We had like two guys in artillery, two guys in the Navy, two guys in the Air Force, and I was in the Army. Well, my job was to lay on helicopters, you know, like if they going out the next morning on a helicopter, you know, assault or something like that, I would call back to the brigade and get the amount of helicopters they need once they got the helicopters, I would ride up over the top, you know, with their commander, you know, mm -hmm. and then I report all the action. And if they need helicopters the next day, I do that. So I enjoy that because, like, I'm going to tell you something. The whole time I was with that Arvin unit, I mean, you talking about eating good in Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Man, I didn't see a bean or a green. I'm telling you, we had like steak and eggs, bacon and eggs, ham and eggs for breakfast. So you can imagine what lunch would be on the green. But anyway, getting back to the, uh, my medal, what happened was that I was off that day and they called me like the scrounger. If they need anything, I'll go find it, you know. So I had a Jeep and I was going down into one of the villages. Well, 
I don't believe it was shot down or anything like that, but one of our helicopters went down and it had like these rocket pods on the side of it. When it crashed, these rocket pods were on fire. You know, they were smoking. I mean, they could have went off at any time. Well, I just want everybody to know what I did. I didn't do it to be a hero, you know. What I did was I pictured myself laying up underneath that helicopter. I want somebody to help me, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Right. Disregarding my help or whatever, I could have got killed. Because like I said, these rocket pods, they were, you know, they were heated and looked like they might smoldering. I crawled in, I pulled out the pilot, put out the co-pilot, and one door gunner. One of the door gunners I was unable to save because due to the fact that when the helicopter crashed, it has this magnesium, you know, and he got burnt up in that magnesium. Well, right after that, after they were all rescued and everything, went to the hospital, wherever they had to go, and went back to my unit. I had no idea about any citations or anything. The next thing I know, I got a, uh, my company commander come and told me that this helicopter crew was throwing me a party, you know, and I'm like, okay, what is this all about? So they threw me a party, you know, and gave me a lot of things, you know. One of the things that I got that I cherished was a complete palace helmet you know, mm -hmm. with the microphones and everything on it. Well, this all happened in May 6, 1970. Well, on May 30, May the 13th, is when my uh, company commander called me into brigade headquarters, which I was awarded the Bronze Star with the V device for Valor, you know. But like I always said, never picture myself being a hero. I just picture myself laying underneath that helicopter and that crash and I want somebody to help me, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got my broad star. Well, thank you for sharing that story. No problem. Uh, that's a fantastic story. Uh, and I'm sure uh, those folks in the helicopter are very grateful you were there and you thought of them, you know, thought of that. that that's fantastic. Uh, uh, I think now, uh, my understanding is uh, you're a nominee for the Ohio, the no, Ohio Hall of Fame. I'm not going to be able to get in this class right here due to the fact is that uh, for some reason or another, my military records were destroyed in a fire they had, I believe, in Kansas City. But there is a uh, there is this one place in Janesville, Wisconsin, which we're dealing with right now, mm -hmm. that I can get the, I have to have, how how uh, Hall of Fame? They had to have the actual uh, paperwork of what I did to get the citation. Right. And I did not have that. I, I had a copy of it. I don't ever know what happened to it or anything like that. But there is a place where they uh, where they issue the awards. And You're stuff looking like for that. the awards database right, or wherever that right, is. Right. Right. So I'm going to get that. So right now right, that should be easy to find. Right. Right now it's too late for me to get that paperwork in. And it's uh, criteria that they have to have that, you mm -hmm. know. So I'm looking at right now for the class of 2023, right. which I would definitely be inducted into. Well, so, I certainly hope they find that paperwork and you get in there. You deserve it, sir. Oh, yeah, we will. You deserve it. That. I got a young lady right here. She's dead on top of it. I'm Good. Sorry, uh, Outstanding. You want to give her a shout out? Yes. I would like to give a shout out to uh, whoever you want. Uh, Miss Cheryl, she's uh, in charge of the women are zillary all right that's 2018 mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. excellent. excellent great lady all right, all right so now i uh, i mentioned earlier that you're the adjutant for vfw post 5018 uh what other uh, organizations are you at well i belong to the american legion seven post 776 mm -hmm. well let me just say this when i first got out of service in 1972 i joined everything that was to be joined Advent Club, American Legion, uh, VFW, Elks, I belong to all of them. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that I did. And I very like, you know, I very much like to participate in anything that I do, you know. And uh, like I said, uh, some of the clubs, you know, I mean, some of the organizations, they're down, you know, and so the only two I belong to right now is Post 5018 and 776. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, any words of uh, advice for uh, young people that are interested in service and or how they can uh, get involved? Well, like I said, right now, 
you have a choice. I didn't. They don't have the draft anymore. Okay? So, and another thing I want to say too, why I was, now normally like you have organizations like the Marine Corps, the Air Force, and the Navy is you volunteer to go. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you volunteer. Well, during the time I got drafted, there was one big long line. And at the end of the line, there was two drill sergeants. I mean, yeah, two two guys. One Army, one Navy. I mean, one a Marine. And they were just picking you. You was in a straight line. Mm -hmm. And they would say, Army. You didn't even have to volunteer for it, okay? They're like, Army, Marine, Army, Marine. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's how bad the Vietnam War was in 67. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Uh, how about, uh, do you have any special events in 5018 or 776 that you uh, want to share with viewers? Uh, I'll let Miss Cheryl tell you about that because she's normally on top of everything. Miss yeah. Cheryl, what's the upcoming event? Uh, let's see. April the 2nd, an Aries party from 2 to 6 is a day party. Mm -hmm. Okay. We also um, going to do May the 14th, 2 to 6, a uh, 70s party. Seventy party, all right. Excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you again for your service to our great country and uh, for uh, taking the time to speak with us and sharing uh, these stories. Uh, anything else that uh, you want to mulligan there? Any help? Anything else you can think of? Well, I just say that if you decide you want to go in, you know, and make the military a career, you know, pick the right uh, MOS, which is your job classification that you want to go into. And uh, everybody goes in, did not have to go to go to war, go to combat. Okay, so you can go in, and right now you have an opportunity of actually pick where you want to, what you want to do, and where you want to go. And I'll tell you right now, bonuses are way better than they were when I was in. Okay, I'm I'm only gonna say this, you know, for some reason <laughs> I could have got ten thousand dollars for six years, but there were some circumstances that. I only got like fifteen hundred dollars because mm -hmm. I had I had to reenlist before, you know, before my time was up. You right. Know, to reenlist. So, like I said, right now, if I were to go in right now, I would volunteer to go to uh, Camp Humphrey, Korea. It is beautiful. <laughs> you avoided it. It is beautiful. It's just like it's like you being on this campus right here. This is what it's like right now. Mm -hmm. You live in barracks. You know, you're not. You won't be out in the feel out there and pup tents, what they call it. You know, you wouldn't have to worry about that, jungles and none of that. So you, you have a better chance right now if you go into the military right now. And the bonuses are out the way. There were, you know what? I wish we didn't have bonuses like that when we went in. They give you almost up to $80,000 right now to right. go into the military. And this is not just for education. This is money in your pocket. That's how I became an all-volunteer force. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully increase the pay a bit and make it more enticing. Uh, so it is an all-volunteer force. Uh, hopefully you know, it'll always stay that way. I do have one thing to say, mm -hmm. and I hope that they don't take this the wrong way, but I forget what president we had at that time when they started that war in Saudi Arabia over there. But that was a wrong situation right there because... When they stopped the draft, what they did was everybody that had uh, reserve time still going on, or you got guys that were in the Army or the Air Force and Navy, they did four years, but they still had their reserve on them, see? Mm. And they that's what, yeah, they when they stopped off. the draft, they came back and got those guys, you know, right. because they still had time to do. Right. But anyway, whichever president that was that sent those National Guard to Saudi Arabia should have been made to live in the VA hospital with them guys because we lost over 58,000 men in Vietnam with regular army people, not no National Guard, regular army people. So you know, National Guard is just like you guys right here. You go to school, you go to a meeting once a month, you go to a summer camp two times out of a year. That is no training for combat. I mean, I know we, we, we lost a lot of people in Vietnam, but the way that these people these uh these people come back from Saudi Arabia is ridiculous. That should never happen. Never happen. 
Well, thank you again, William, for uh, sharing with us today. Uh, you know, you're, you're the epitome of uh, Never Stop Serving. You're still serving today. Won a bronze star in, uh, in the 70s and still uh, serving your country today. Thank you so much for everything you do. You're welcome, sir. All right. We're still going to go to breakfast today, right? Yes, sir. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Here at Never Stop Serving, we highlight veterans that continue to serve beyond the military service. Please continue to watch for, uh, for new episodes of Never Stop Serving. Also, continue to watch the Veterans Memorial Park and Digital Library Facebook page for upcoming events and updates. If you are a veteran and you would like to share your story, please send it uh, to us uh, at an email, gvmpdl at gmail.com. That's gvmpdl at gmail.com. Thank you for watching. This is Mike. We'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. Please visit us on our social media sites. Please consider contributing to our mission in some way. Also, we are always looking for veterans and their families to share their stories with us. Be sure to join us next week for our next episode of Never Stop Serving.